I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I hope that meditation was helpful to you. It was for me. And <clears throat> so much of practice really is about resting our mind on what draws our heart so that as we increasingly dwell in that which is beneficial, wholesome, and wise, and enjoyable, those qualities increasingly dwell within us as scientists are discovering through, in effect, hardwiring themselves into our own brain so that more and more those qualities are with you wherever you go. And when you're rattled, you can return to them over time more and more readily. This is a process of learning, broadly stated. Uh, most of the time, there's no quick fix. <laughs> it's a gradual process of releasing and cultivating and establishing. And it's, it's okay that it's gradual. In, in part, it means it's authentic. You can trust it. You can feel yourself changing in these ways. And you can help yourself along the way. One way that I hope to explore that we can help ourselves is by resting in the qualities of consciousness, the state of mind, the state of being, really, that was marked by uh, the Buddha a long time ago, uh, presumably him, maybe somebody else wrote it, influenced by him, in the Loving Kindness Sutra, or using the Pali terms, the Metta Sutta, which I put into the chat. And if you scroll up in the chat, and I'll put it, maybe other people can post it again as a whole from time to time, you can see the Metta Sutta, which is quite well known in Buddhist practice, especially those centered around um, early Buddhism. And um, I'd like to explore with you some of the key words in it and terms and the feelings in it, while also exploring what could be called the shadow of compassion, the shadow of love and kindness, and the importance of including uh, that which might seem to be the opposite of those qualities we aspire to, including them in our awareness so that we don't push them away and disown them and suppress them inside ourselves so that they leak out or hijack us in many kinds of ways, including sometimes unconscious ones. It's an interesting exploration here, isn't it? So. I'd like to read the Metta Sutta to you. You might read it along with me, it's in the chat. Um, this is um, adapted from a longer version of the Metta Sutta, and I adapted quite respectfully, and I've drawn on different translations to kind of come together with, with a translation that um, I personally like the best and relate the most to. And here we go. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy at heart. Omitting none, whether they are weak or strong, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise anyone, anywhere, or through anger or ill will wish for another to suffer. Just as a mother would protect her child, her only child, with her own life, even so, you should cultivate a boundless heart toward all beings. 
you should cultivate kindness toward the whole world with a boundless heart. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without enmity or hate. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as you are alert, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness. This is called a sublime abiding here and now. It's moving to me <laughs> to share that with you and hopefully and perhaps it's moving to you to hear it. Um, just a bit of clarity about a word that might have kind of startled you there. Uh, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness. The reference there is to a sustained mindfulness of loving kindness. So I'd like to highlight a couple of words, maybe a few of them for you, and then kind of swing out to the shadow of compassion and then come back into this sutta and open it up then for your comments and questions, probably mainly through the chat. So it's really interesting to take the teachings of the Buddha First, as he recommended, absolutely as he recommended, judge them on their merits as you decide for yourself. These are not teachings that are offered as commandments from on high that we should just expect, accept on faith alone, but that we should observe them, we should study them, we should examine them and consider them pragmatically in our own life and see them pragmatically in the lives of others in terms of do they foster happiness? and welfare for ourselves and others. And if so, and they stand the test of time, okay, then we can relate to them as credible and meaningful to ourselves. In that context then, I find it's really helpful to sort of slow it down and uh, in effect relate to these teachings as instructions or suggestions, tips even, coaching, from a profoundly wise and, and developed being you know, who functioned in a stream of teaching from, from himself and others that has now come down to us. So in that sense, when the Buddha says, omitting none, wow, none. Rest with that as a kind of instruction, wow. Think of the people we tend to omit from the field of our care and concern. Either we just omit them because we're not aware of them or because of our privilege, we can afford to omit them. I believe Tanisi Coates has defined privilege as one aspect of privilege is not having to take certain things into account. Who are we not taking into account? Who do we have the privilege of just not taking into account, ignoring. Um, and to what extent do we deliberately omit some beings from the field of our compassion and the field of our wishing well? It's very interesting to explore what it's like to separate, to differentiate, to decouple compassion benevolence and goodwill uh, from um, approval or agreement or justice seeking. For myself, it's been a very useful exploration to notice that I can rest in compassion and wishing well for those who have wronged me, and I know they have wronged me, and I recognize that um, I you know, want to separate from them while still wishing them well. You, you can do that. It's really freeing and it's good for you. It's helpful to you to separate out that recognition of injustice and 
separate out um, desire for justice to be served or separate out your hurt from how they have injured you genuinely to separate that from, you know, I just refuse to let my boundless compassion as the Buddha teaches, I just refuse to let that be contaminated or, or hijacked or obstructed for my own sake by negative reactivity toward others. Now this is a direction to move in, but it's really possible and it's an exploration and what you can what you will find is that as you decouple, as you disengage, as you disentangle my topic last week, your own warm-heartedness, your own open-heartedness from also present emotional reactivity to others or um, you know, values-centered beliefs that justice should be served upon them, kind of separate that out. It gives you a kind of internal freedom that you can rest in. And you can rest in your warm-heartedness, no matter what they do. You can rest in your um, lovingness, uh, qualities of goodness, whatever they do. Wonderfully freeing and nurturing for you kind to you to rest in that freedom and recognize, of course, that it could be a, uh, a pursuit. This is perhaps an appropriate moment for me to acknowledge and talk about this very important comment that Maria offered at, 50, at 5.51 p.m. Pacific time. Quote, how can, you, how can you disengage when you are discriminated against? It hurts. It makes me angry. I know I won't change reality or the person that does it, but how can I move on? Really understandable. And here's where I would like to talk about uh, or begin to talk about compassion's shadow. And First, I want to make an observation, which is that as I've now increasingly am moving into, I'll call it the pro-social world of people who are trying to help the world be a better place, uh, one of the things that I've encountered along with an awareness of hundreds and hundreds of wonderful initiatives and people and programs and organizations, sincere efforts around the world, Along with that, and sometimes with regard to the same people, I've also encountered a, a certain sometimes startling territoriality and possessiveness and prickliness. Hmm, interesting. And one aspect of that I've wondered about is the perhaps degree to which people and I look at myself in this regard as well, who have good intentions and are really committed to justice and making the world a better place and to treating all others with kindness, omitting none, can perhaps along the way have suppressed some of their own very natural human rancor or um, anxiety or um, possessiveness or sense of scarcity or feeling beleaguered or not enough or insecure in what they're doing, pushed it down so that in ways that Carl Jung talked about, wrote about over oh, a century ago, in ways that the shadow can return. The shadow follows after us wherever we go. What do we do about that? And here I'd like to share a story that hopefully will be relevant from my early days as a rock climber. And when I first started to climb, I was uh, I would go out with my friend over the day and we'd come back to a campground at night and crawl into our sleeping bags and eventually fall asleep. And repeatedly, just as I was about to fall asleep, there would be this extremely intense, powerful sense and imagery of tumbling through space, falling, thousand feet, heading toward rocks on the bottom to splatter in a bloody mess and die. Ugh. 
I whoa, pulled myself out of that really fast. Whoa, what's that? Whew. I'd shake it off. And then in my sleeping bag, under the pine trees, start to fall asleep again. And, it, and again, it would happen. Just as I was falling asleep, boom, there I was, tumbling through space, headed for certain death. <laughs> Pulled out. That happened several times. And then, finally, I had the wherewithal somehow to just tell myself, hey, Rick, go with it. Surrender. <laughs> See what happens. So the next time it arose, tumbling through space, headed for a certain bloody death, I let go into it. And just as I was about to smack into those rocks, realization came through that what this was, was the imagery of all the fear I had suppressed over the course of the day climbing. I thought as a young climber, I had to shove it down or it would overtake me. And I realized that I, need to, I needed to more function in a middle place in which I could feel the fear as I was climbing, including leading, so that if I did fall, it would you know, be significant. I could fall 20 or 40 feet easily and maybe hit something on the way down before the rope caught me, you know, that I, 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 I should not um, su entirely suppress it, but I could not let myself be overwhelmed by it. I needed to find that middle place. And I did, and you know, it's been a very good middle place for me over the years. Well, I think the same thing is true here with regard to compassion and kindness, where we find that middle place in which we allow and make room for, fill in the blank, our hatefulness, our cruelty, our callousness, our desire to just make them pay. That look in the face, that look in the eyes, to, to allow it, it's there. Needs to be regulated, that's part of the middle way, but suppressing, denying, not including in the field of awareness, just doesn't work. Uh, you know, the mind is not like a flesh toilet where it just all goes away. As I joke, it's more like um, a septic tank, you know, it sticks around. So uh, it's, it's best to, you know, be aware of it and to process it initially. And this goes to the point that Maria has made here and the teaching of the Buddha about the first and second dart. This might be familiar to you. And uh, if so, uh, you know, hopefully this will, you know, be helpful for you in maybe new ways even. That the Buddha taught that there are first darts in this life inevitable, inescapable, physical, and by extension, emotional pain, including the emotional pain, understandably, that arises when others mistreat you, such as through discrimination, prejudice, bias, injustice, especially if it happens for the umpteenth time in larger structural systems that have disadvantaged you in order to advantage others. So unfair a first start reaction of being offended by the injustice, a sense of um, being affronted by it, of being angered by it, being hurt by it, is totally normal. We evolved as uh, very, very social primates who over time developed both a deep sense of injustice and um, related uh, motivations and feelings of love and altruism. Two sides of one coin. Well, it's understandable that we feel these things. So we do feel them. Now, in terms of in, being entangled by them, there are skillful ways to experience the first starts of life in a spaciousness of mindful awareness. Because when we're identified with the first dart experiences or hijacked by them, we suffer a lot and sometimes make others suffer as well. On the other hand, if we can be with those first dart experiences with some spaciousness, maybe noting them to ourselves, pissed off 
at prejudice yet again, or whatever you want to say about it, or there they go again, you know, noting it, noting it, without too much top spin of attitude that I injected there, um, noting it, witnessing it, tracking the body sensations of our reactions, being aware of the feelings, being aware of the memories, the previous similar, earlier similar experiences that get stirred up, um, the bodily sensations of freezing or shock or the pit in your stomach, all of that, you know, being with that mindfully, being with those first starts mindfully is wise, is skillful. It's what the Buddha taught. It's what generations of modern psychotherapists, including beautiful recent evolution, such as Stephen Hayes' creation of ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, and other forms of mindfulness-based therapies that really emphasize the acceptance, the being with, and the bringing of self-compassion to yourself about first starts, really effective. And we can simultaneously disentangle from the second darts we throw ourselves. The stories we tell ourselves, the angry reactions we fuel inside ourselves, the ways we bring others in to, you know, pound on the campaign, to, to drive our campaign against those bad people, um, the meanings we put on certain events, all of that is constructed by ourselves. There are reasons why we construct it, life history, habit, and all the rest of that, but we construct it ourselves. And that's what we can disentangle from, right? We don't disengage in the sense of denying or suppressing our natural first start reactions to being discriminated against. We don't disengage from those. We practice with them in a skillful ways, in a space of spaciousness and kindness toward ourselves. We do deliberately with practice, disentangle from, disengage from our second dart reactivity. That clearly is worth disentangling from. The, the fuel that we add to the fire, disentangle from that. The identification with our opinions and positions, disentangling from that. Um, the sense of taking things very personally that are more a matter of terrible, but fairly impersonal, generic, universal systems of injustice, disengaging from taking it oh so personally, and disengaging from blaming ourselves in some ways, internalizing the oppression, disengaging from that, disentangling from that. That is really worth doing. That's where, in, in these ways, we, um, can uh, both suffer less and awaken more and all and without creating compassion's shadow. Uh, I think about people, I was talking with someone earlier today who's a real activist, including environmental activist, and I was just sharing some of these reflections as I was developing them for this you know, evening. And he said, you know, in, in the field of social justice, uh, there's so many people, he said, who are really focused on, in effect, being nice or you know, being positive about, for example, the climate crisis and not giving way to despair. There's a place for not getting way to despair, but there's a place also for being royally pissed off about it, you know, royally pissed off about the forces of greed and wealth and power and their allies that are driving the planet and humanity to the, to the abyss by the end of the century. Uh, it's okay. It's okay to include that. Um, if we suppress it, then we start developing compassion shadow. And eventually it all comes back to leak. You know, it leaks out eventually, it returns. What Freud called the return of the repressed. It's understandable that even as we practice the metta sutta and the cultivation of metta with people, that you know sometimes we can get really mad at them or be really hurt by them or be just kind of stunned at how clueless they are or 
have your mind blown by their inability to learn or receive your input, starting with euphemisms and hints, <laughs> gradually escalating to very blunt language and just like, what? They still don't get it, you know? Um, that is normal. That's arising. That's normal. We can include that. We don't have to suppress it. And in fact, it's by including it that we become paradoxically free of it. And we're more and more able to disengage from struggling with those normal reactions. And therefore, we can engage with, as we disengage from struggling with that, we can engage with our own open-heartedness and our own sweetness and kindness and lovingness that's independent increasingly of what others do. It's unconditional increasingly. Your kindness, your compassion, the field of your good wishes becomes increasingly unconditional. It's not based on conditions, uh, including who happens to be moving through that field of your open-heartedness and good wishes, which is sustained by also having good wishes for yourself and taking good care of, of yourself. Because to go back to the Metta Sutta, and if you haven't found it, maybe I'm looking at the one I put in at 41 minutes after the hour, uh, after the previous hour. Other people may have put it again. Go back to it. It says all beings, all beings. Who is included among all beings? It's you. It's you. May you be happy and secure. May you be happy at heart, right? Wow. Think of the movement, the, the motivation that's in this teaching from the Buddha. How sweet it is, how passionate it is, how all-encompassing it is. And then consider what it would be like to apply it to yourself to apply it to yourself. I'm going to reread it, adapting it to you. See how this lands. Maybe close your eyes and let this sink in. Maybe imagine, as I am factually, speaking to you personally. Imagine that in effect, through me now, the Buddha is speaking to you personally. The Buddha stream carried through generations, 25 centuries of people in deep practice is speaking to you. May you be happy and secure. May you be happy at heart. Not leaving you out, whether you are weak or strong, seen or unseen by others. Wherever you are, may you be happy. May you not Deceive yourself or despise yourself in any way. Through anger or ill will, may you never wish for yourself to suffer. Just as a mother would protect her child, her only child, with her own life, even so, you should cultivate a boundless heart toward yourself. You should cultivate kindness toward the whole of yourself with a boundless heart. 
above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without any kind of enmity or hate toward yourself. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as you are alert, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness of kindness toward yourself. This is an aspect of what is called a sublime abiding here and now. What's it like to hear this? What's it like to let it sink in? I like listening to this applied to myself also. I could use a break. <laughs> <laughs> you could too, most likely. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a peek at the chat and uh, see what's come in the last uh, 15 minutes or so here. So Joanne... Uh, Rhodes at 50 minutes past 6 p.m. writes, is there too much emphasis on happy and perhaps content? I think that's what you mean there. Um, so first off, translations come in in different ways. Um, the way I think of happy uh, is not in a trivial sense. It's easy to trivialize that term. And, and the sense from the Buddha, which is really interesting, is that uh, there's a real focus uh, around relieving suffering and the recognition in the Buddha Dharma that so much of our suffering has to do with our reactions to the various conditions of life. Suffering um, is not, much of the time suffering is not inherent. It's not innate. We don't have to suffer. It's more like we create conditions that increase suffering. That's true on the one hand. On the other hand, the Buddha was described as the happy one, uh, not simply the one who wasn't suffering anymore. <laughs> and so there's a lot of emphasis actually throughout the teachings of the Buddha about um, happiness, including finding the gladness in the recognition of your own goodness. It's okay. Now, in that context, what I mean by the word happy, and I suspect this would be included in the way in which happy is un, happiness was understood in early Buddhism, uh, is a combination of both hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. So happiness as hedonic well-being is the ordinary happiness of, you know, drinking water when you're thirsty, uh, you know, easing out of a tight jacket or a tight pair of shoes, uh, hanging out with friends. Uh, being feeling loving, feeling loved, uh, accomplishing things, uh, cheering on the San Francisco 49ers who are doing really well uh, with their new third string young quarterback, what? Uh, that's hedonic well being. A lot of many forms of hedonic well being, including just simply watching a beautiful sunset. Then there's eudaimonic well being. It's a fancy new word that has to do with a sense of fulfillment meaning or purpose that's um, not um, to, that does not require hedonic well-being at the time. One example of that is uh, being really tired, really worn out and still standing by the bedside of someone you love, um, hanging in there uh, with you know little children late at night or with, aging parents uh, late in their lives, hanging in there. May not be particularly, it's not pleasurable, uh, it's not in a hedonic sense, but it's deeply, deeply important. Perhaps the most important thing in your life. That's eudaimonic well-being. And by happiness, I mean both of them. And I think that's what's being spoken to 
here. It's not just, it's metta is kindness, which does not presuppose suffering. Compassion, karuna in Pali, uh, does presuppose suffering. So it's interesting that this is the metta sutta, which is the kindness sutta. It's about happiness, which of course does tend to include the wish that beings not suffer. I might want to add that the root of the word metta is friend. So it's a kind of friendliness. You know, it's a friendliness, a loving kindness uh, toward, toward other beings. Okay. Is there a book on Buddhism I could recommend? That's Renee's question. Um, if you go to my website, rickhanson.son.net, and you noodle around, I'm not sure where, I think it's under the About uh, tab, and I have this thing called Key Offerings. Uh, I list books that I really recommend. Um, just off the top of my head, there are multiple really good books on Buddhism. Um, I think uh, you know, one of my favorites actually is called Saltwater Buddha uh, by Jamal Yogis, uh, who connects surfing to uh, the teachings of Buddhism. That's a really good one. Uh, what the Buddha Taught by Walpola Rahula is a classic. It's, it's more dense and detailed, but it's it's a really good summary. Um, yeah, I would just look around. I, I find those really good. Um, Atara Brock's book, True Refuge, is actually a very deep exploration of the Buddha Dharma in very modern and even secular terms. True Refuge, wonderful book. I'll leave it there. Okay. So... Along the way, I want to speak to Nancy W.'s comment at 7.05 p.m. But I cannot find a place where I can love and forgive those who are about power and greed and hurt so many and have and continue to destroy our collective well-being. Yes, Trump, Putin, etc. It's a very important comment. You can see it at 7.05 p.m. So a couple things here. The first is... What I'm talking about here is not an admonition. It's not any kind of finger wagging, the Buddhas or my own, at you, like, oh, you got to do something. First and foremost, we have to be authentic. And in my book, Neurodharma, I, uh, with his permission, uh, quote Larry Yang, who essentially has a um, sequence that's better said by him than I can remember now, essentially it goes like this. Uh, May I love everyone. If I can't love everyone, can I wish everyone well? If I can't wish everyone well, can I at least not wish that they suffer? And if I can't not wish that they suffer, may I do as little harm as possible? Kind of like that. So we find our own place with the people, with the people uh, that we're dealing with. And it's helpful in your practice to not uh, go out to edge cases you know, I remember teaching at Spirit Rock Meditation Center back uh, uh, during, you know, around 2007 or so when uh, um, George Bush II was president and Dick Cheney was the vice president. And there I would be in a room with a couple hundred, you know, very well-intended Marin County people. And I would, you know, kind of mention maybe Dick Cheney to bring into the field of their compassion. And rah, 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 that was too much. So you start with what's within range, and then you build out from there, first point. Second point, um, you may not need to love you know, Vladimir Putin or others or forgive them. That may well be too high a bar. But what you can do is not hate them. And it's helpful to distinguish between a righteous anger that's natural, a kind of fieriness, outrage that's healthy. Like that's a that's a normal moral reaction to distinguish that from rancor, ill will, and the desire to, you know, just grind and <clears throat> you may seek justice. You may seek justice. I seek justice but without that kind of punitive, cruel, even sadistic stuff getting in. Now, to avoid compassion's shadow, 
We need to surface those qualities within us and make room for them to breathe. And interestingly, as we make more room for our own cruelty and I'll say wickedness, to make room for that, paradoxically, ironically, it, it, it loses its power over you. That's the teaching, a, t- a key teaching related to compassion and shadow. So we make room for those reactions, but we keep disengaging, disentangling from those second darts of cruelty and sadism. We disengage from that um, and rest just simply in whatever we can find, which could simply be a kind of omnidirectional wishing for the well-being of all that doesn't leave anyone out. It may start with these edge case characters, right? Um, Where you just find that you're disentangling from hatred. That's a good place to start. And then you may find over time, you can can locate um, an authentic, omnidirectional, open-heartedness, warm-heartedness field that, you know, wishes at some level, maybe some place inside him at the core of it all that, um, that extends kindness and compassion, even, let's say, to Vladimir Putin. Okay, so I'm going to roll on down. Oh, I wanted, yeah, I, I wanted to mention something which I put in the chat way up somewhere. Aha, check out the Global Compassion Coalition.org and as I very rapidly do this, another link I'm going to put in. I'm giving a, like a webinar um, Thursday morning Pacific time next week, the 29th, and you're all invited. Uh, I'm going to do a whole thing just kind of as a gratitude for everybody around resting and renewing ourselves. And you might really like to come to that. And of course, I appreciate any and all support for um, the Compassion Coalition, which the world really needs. It's a fundamental question. How do we join together to be big enough, to be strong enough, to drive the systemic change that our world solely needs? Well, as we finish here, I want to encourage you to take a look at the Metta Sutta and find what within it is meaningful to you. There might be a word, there might be a phrase that you want to take forward in the week to come to practice with. You know, Maybe there's a word that just pops out when you think of a challenging relationship, somebody that you're kind of tangled up with. Is there a word here or a phrase here that really could give you some lubrication and space and disengagement in that relationship or toward yourself. If you imagine the metta sutta, including you, which it does, uh, is there something here that pops out, a word or phrase in the metta sutta that would really, really, really be helpful to you? You know, for example, um, as I did this with you myself tonight, uh, the notion of cultivating a boundless heart, boundless heart is a powerful phrase. It's unbounded, in other words. There's no edge to it. A boundless heart, I'm very familiar with that feeling and that practice. But to imagine applying a boundless heart <laughs> to Ricardo, <laughs> me, Ricardo's not actually my given name, it's Roderick. Uh, whoa, <laughs> that's, a, that's a new step. That's a good one. So what might be a, a good step for you with this Metta Sutta? So as we finish tonight, I'd like to read it one more time in its traditional form as, as it's adapted here. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy at heart omitting none, whether they are weak or strong, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born. 
May all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise anyone anywhere or through anger or ill will wish for anyone to suffer. Just as a mother would protect her child, her only child, with her own life, even so, you should cultivate a boundless heart toward all beings. You should cultivate kindness toward the whole world with a boundless heart. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without enmity or hate, whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as you are alert, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness. This is called a sublime abiding here and now.